Welcome to the Impact Learning Visionaries podcast, where we celebrate the unsung heroes of the learning and development industry. As always, we'll be bringing some laughter and a bit of fun along the way, but more importantly, you'll get some incredible insights, key lessons, and unique perspectives on everything related and possibly unrelated to training and development. Let's get this show on the road. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the <clears throat> Impact Learning Visionaries podcast. And today we are joined by Carla Butter, who has almost two decades of experience facilitating and supporting organizations to change and transform successfully using fit for purpose learning and development solutions. She's passionate about using the power of learning and development strategies to improve the nimbleness of teams with more significant change and sustainable impact. Now, technology plays a big role in how Carla approaches learning and development, and she believes that when we harness it correctly, we can create delightful experiences and creative learning solutions that have a big impact on business. She's also passionate about mentoring others and strives to create exciting career journeys for her own team. One of her greatest joys is recognizing the potential in others and <clears throat> to take chances on people, upskilling them to become good designers and developers who are advocates for the learner and their experience. Carla, welcome to the show. Thank you, Jason. I was, <clears throat> it was interesting, as I was reading that, I said, well, this could kind of be my bio too. So I think we'll have a lot of common interest to share in this conversation, but I'm, I'm gonna jump right in with probably a bit of a big question, which is, uh, <laughs> as someone who's, who's kind of in, in the kind of, of, you know, like right in the middle of learning and development is experiencing it on a daily basis. I mean, what are your impressions of, of learning and development in organizations today? I mean, what do you think is the good, the bad and the ugly? That is a big question. Um, and I think you've summarized it well to say that there are great learning programs. There are programs that are so innovative and so inspiring. You can tell that it's been designed to engage and to motivate. I think the, what I have also seen, unfortunately, are, are learning programs or training where the learn it's not written for the learner. You can clearly see that um, an analysis of your target audience was not taken into account, but also what I find absent in programs where I would say that's the bad and the ugly is just going back to basics, applying adult learning theory and andragogy and learning theories in terms of how you write the variety of learning activities that we pull into a curriculum or a journey. So I would say those basic foundational things are, are absent in the bad and the ugly. Yeah. And I mean, over the last, over the last 10 years of your journey, I mean, what, mm. what have you noticed about the industry that's, that's changed and, and how you've adapted to that change? I think, as we know, a lot of learning has shifted to online. And that also created, I want to say, pressure on how quickly us as, as providers are expected to churn out learning programs, which then boils back to the, the research and analysis phase that is shortened and less contact, I want to say, with the business or opportunity to make contact with the business and immerse yourself in, in the problems, in the nature of why things are going wrong and how we are going to address it in the learning design. Um, what I've also seen, and, and this was something that I noticed COVID and, and post-COVID, is that a lot of providers have popped up that don't necessarily have a good foundation in terms of learning design. And I think, especially in South Africa, I find that, you know, it's, it's l and is not a profession. Um, the requirements aren't really clear in terms of what qualification can you go and study. There are a lot of fabulous courses out there, but people don't really know 
which ones are the most applicable or useful. And I think that is a part of the problem that we find there are people that are building training programs. And, and for me, there's a difference between training and learning maybe um, that are not achieving the outcomes that organizations are e expected to deliver, which obviously makes our clients look bad. And that is our job. Um, to solve those problems for them and to make them look good. So you said something which I actually found very fascinating because I hadn't actually thought about it before. But right at the beginning of that conversation, you you mentioned you know over the over the kind of like like the last ten years, you know, obviously the introduction of e-learning has has changed the way that that learning and development professionals go about doing learning in the organisation and and. You, you kind of mentioned that it, it takes you further away from your customer um, mm. in a sense, because the, you're not doing the one-on-one -on -one or the classroom-based learning. You're kind of relying on, on a piece of technology to do that learning for you. And I hadn't actually ever considered that before, is, is the impact that that could have on learning and development professionals and how that plays out inside an organization when you kind of starting to feel more and more disengaged from having your finger on the pulse of how people are responding, which you can see in a face-to-face in -face basis, but it's harder to see when you have this barrier of technology between you and the learner. How, how are you kind of, I mean, how have you experienced that and how are you compensating for that? Um, Yo, yeah, well, how we're experiencing it, if you think about I love the six Ds of, of breakthrough learning framework. And I find that the first D and the last D almost gets lost in translation um, when you are building, I want to say, regular e-learning, not serious games, those um, simulations, those type of things. So the research and development phase is, is, is either shorter or, as you mentioned, we are further away from, from your subject matter experts, but also from your learners, definitely, you know, removed. And I think the other thing is that because we are delivering a product that is actually being facilitated by an LMS or an LXP, we don't necessarily get to see that data to learn from, you know, what is happening, how are the learners responding to it, um, what is working and what is not and why. So in terms of addressing that, or overcoming that, I think that is the, the job of the project manager or the performance consultant to educate your clients in terms of the value of, of you know, spending that time um, upfront in the business to really understand their world, their, the day in the life, um, the challenges that your learners will be facing, but also then the value of the data. The alternative is to help them understand from the get-go, what, what data would you like to see? and analyze what would you like to do with it, you know, after the learning has been completed so that we build that into the design and that we almost show them what is possible in terms of custom reporting, you know, what insights can, can you get from that? So the, the interesting thing is, is I mean, in, in that sense, I mean, so I'm a huge advocate of data and I, I, I once upon a time used to be in, in kind of analytics and big data. But uh, I, there's, there's, a, there's an interesting kind of, of disconnect here is that the res we talked about kind of a, a barrier to, to kind of understanding how people are interpreting learning as technology and the solution to that problem, which is, is kind of getting feedback in terms of data is ironically another technology. Do you think there is going to be a space where humans can observe humans you know I, I remember i mean from your bio we, we talked about you know creating delightful experiences and creative learning solutions there's got to be an element of that which is is bringing the human being back into the conversation you know, do you see kind of a, a possibility of that or is it is it going to just be we've got lots and lots of people to train we've got to use the data that how you how do you bring humanity back into the process 
It's a very interesting question, and, and I must say that is a, a huge concern for me, especially with um, the Im influence of AI in l and um, But again, I think it is important for us as the designer or the project manager, performance consultant, to stay close to the customer, the, you know, that l and team and to help them understand why it is important that we run pilots, that we are able to connect with the learners themselves. In South Africa specifically, technology and being tech savvy is already a barrier to learning. It's not something that we can take for granted. When you work with your big corporates, you know that people are relatively tech savvy. But if you go into the manufacturing, food and bev, mining industries, you've got to provide for that human connection up front. And how I possibly see that is maybe pre-delivery in terms of we can still do, do e-learning and use e-learning, use technology. I mean, companies are pushing for scalable, economical, um, learning solutions. That is never going to change. But a pre or a post connection, you know, I, I see the value, still see the value of that face to face, human to human connection that gives us anecdotal data that you won't pick up in a learner record, mm. if that makes sense. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think there's, there's a, there's a, I mean, it, it's always been my passion because I, I love human-centered design to understand the, the impact that you're having on the, the person who's using your technology or solution. So I, I guess, you know, it's, it's just the reason for this is, is really just for me to kind of unpack that in my own head with, a, with an expert is to just say, you know, as someone who's in technology, I spend my entire day thinking about how technology can solve problems. But... At, at the same time, I also sit with this kind of other challenge about understanding that it's not about technology, it's about people and how they feel about, you know, your, your services and your, and your products. So it, it was an interesting, um, I think, thing to just chat about. Um, but just going on from there, I, I you know, so we, we talked about um, the, the kind of designing solutions and, and the role that, that technologies have played. But as someone who is you know, kind of working on a daily basis, I spend a lot of time asking people just how they, how they kind of navigate this new and emerging landscape of learning and development, because I think it has changed quite significantly. And, and if anything, you know, the, the kind of pace of change in the world, the introduction of technology, the expectations on L&D are just like becoming more and more uh, challenging. And as, as someone who's kind of you know, gone through this process and, and working in you know, kind of, of, of large organizations and, and with like lots of people is how, how you navigate that. How, how do you kind of in, in like, you know, sell, sell your ideas? How do you sell your concepts? How do you do the kind of crazy and zany ideas, the creative stuff, the stuff that creates delight? How do you get the buy-in for that? I mean, there's all of these kind of factors at play. For me, Jason, I th what is important is firstly to understand performance and productivity. I want to say on a scientific level, if, if we mm -hmm. understand that, we know what, what behaviors need to stop, start, continue, improve, decrease, whatever the case may be. I think the other thing, how I approach it is, I don't see, and I, I believe that you'll agree with me, that Allen D does not exist in a vacuum. So you firstly need to understand the business that you are supporting on a granular level. You need to understand what does profitability mean to them? What does sustainability mean? You need to understand the, the elements of the employee life cycle. 
you know, what, what are the trends and the challenges in recruitment? What kind of people are we, um, are we bringing into the business? Are we appointing? And what are the skills gaps that they enter the business with? Um, you need to understand where your talent and succession management plans are going, or what the strategy is. Um, how are we delivering on internal mobility issues and, and retention and career growth? You also need to understand, I want to say, spend time in the finance department and talk to them about where are we losing money and why. Speak to the marketing department and see, you know, what are the promises that we are making to clients and what are the underlying behaviors that need to support that. So when we have layered, you know, this, this picture in our mind of, of performance and, and productivity and the underlying behaviors that we require to, to, build, to build capability in a business, then you can start thinking about design and who we are designing for because you've got your ideal state. And I think that is something that I try very hard um, to to get accustomed with the moment that we start dealing with a client and we are fortunate to deal with many businesses and you know that is I, I just love businesses and how they work and understanding the processes and where things go wrong and possibly why because that is where and, and that is where the light bulb moment comes in. You talked about bringing in the light and, and designing something that is creative. When you have that as a foundation, that is when you can start ideating something that's going to push the boundaries and excite your client, but also obviously solve the problem and move the needle in the right direction. Hmm. So you, you've, you've mentioned a very intriguing word, which is curious. Um, and and it, it's, it's one I want to kind of tap into for a little bit, um, if you'll indulge me, because I think You've described something that that I think is quite powerful and maybe it's something that's lacking in in a, a lot of different areas is you described when you kind of get into a business that it's something that it's it excites you. You're kind of you're curious, you're you kind of want to understand the business and, and there's almost this kind of intrinsic drive to want to take this engine and like dismantle it, unpack it and see how it works and see where there's opportunities to improve. But the reality is not everybody is like that. And you know, in, in your mind, how do you think having that curiosity, that natural curiosity, that natural in, in like intrinsic desire to want to unpack and understand something, how do you think it kind of plays into your ability to be an effective learning and, and development professional? I think it has a huge impact because, you know, we, as L&D professionals, we want a seat at the strategy table. Mm. But we cannot deliver on, on that seat, that um, accountability that we have, if we cannot um, think in terms of the system, the holistic system. So that is why unpacking the business in its entirety is so important and having that curiosity. I think for me, um, because we work in different industries, the research that we have to do to really understand, I mean, you cannot teach if you don't understand. And the research is so much part of, you know, I want to say our DNA, that there's no other choice than to unpack it to a granular level. But I think it's it's even more than that. Because sometimes, and especially because the in your client business, you find, or I have found, that a lot of people have kind of landed the training manager or L&D manager role almost accidentally. Um, you know, it, it wasn't a very intentional career path, which means that they are also knowledge gaps and I say that with, with this with great respect because they work under a lot of pressure um, you know to deliver to their businesses but when they come and ask you for a solution 
that curiosity to unpack the problem, to, to make sure that you are defining it correctly, sometimes leads you to suggest a whole different solution. Um, for instance, they might ask you for conflict management training. And when you start unpacking it, you realize, but this is actually a diversity issue in the business. So it is also important for an L&D professional to make sure that you really that you really understand whether the client has defined the problem correctly, because otherwise, you know, whatever you build, it can be so great, but it's not going to solve the problem. And in the end, that is your good name on the line because you going to you are, will have delivered a product that didn't move that needle. So that I think is why curiosity plays such an important role. And I mean, what is what is your personal journey around curiosity? How how did you become this naturally kind of curious person who wants to to find out how the businesses works? Again, I, I don't think everybody. I think there's, there's two elements, like one, not everybody is like that, and two, some people who want to be like that just don't know where to start to become like that. I think it might, it might be because I've worked in different businesses. In, in my previous life, which was 10 years long, I was in public relations and marketing in the hospital industry. So I, I got to understand that industry very well. But I think... The curiosity actually is born out of fear. And what I mean by that is whenever I start a new project, I'm, I am fearful that I'm going to let the client down. And what I do with that fear is I dive into research and I research until I find that I feel confident enough that I know enough to be able to deliver or design a solution that's going to work. So the curiosity is really sparked um, by a deeper, stronger emotion, but it's a strategy that has worked very well for me. Um, yeah, I think the other thing is I, I do have a, a brain for business and how things are put together, understanding value chains and you know, understanding the different facets of a business, not only focusing on l and I think we are in a wonderful position to touch every discipline in a business and, and make you know, a difference. But you have to understand what is the core purpose of that element in the business. Again, bringing it back to systems thinking so that you can design for you know, the problem that they, are, that, that they are facing. Yeah. And I mean, there were, there were two, <clears throat> two things I want to kind of pick up on, just kind of following on from that is, <clears throat> you talked about, you know, um, designing or, or, or trying to understand the right problem. You know, I, almost mm -hmm. like getting to that kind of, of root cause analysis, identifying mm -hmm. what's the actual problem here as opposed to what am I seeing at face value? And then you just went and threw in the systems thinking kind of of terms. So we, we're going to go and play there for a while. Um, so I think we can all agree that every single organization we go into nowadays is, is inherently complex. Um, and, and often that's a result of the fact that, that human beings are involved and, and we do one thing very well is we make things more complex um, just by nature of, of who we are. Um, and I, I find a lot of people struggle with, you know, that, that complexity that they, they think of, of businesses as, as machines and machines are very predictable in how they work. Um, whereas systems and especially kind of, you know, biological systems because humans are involved are very unpredictable. So when, when you look, you know, kind of coming into a new organization and are asked to solve a problem. You know, how how are you kind of doing that root cause analysis, getting kind of uncovering what the real issue is, and you know, are, you know what what tools, techniques um, are you using generally to try and and ferret out the the chaff from what's actually really going on here? Um, I have a little bit of a checklist, but it goes like this. 
schedule interviews. I think the but the first thing is I I look at you know how the business is structured in terms of people, how you know people report into each other, how teams work together. So that would be, I think, my starting point, because then I can and and then the next level would be to build the value chain and make sure that I understand how these pieces fit together. Because what often happens is that you are asked to deliver a solution for department A. But there are dependencies from department Z and department X, you know, on either side, which means that that solution actually needs to be an umbrella which brings these teams or elements together. Otherwise, you know, we work in pockets. And I think that is something else that you that that you discover in these interviews is that departments and teams work in, in silos and you've got to understand where the breakdowns in communications or miscommunication happen and how the processes need to fit together so that Department A performance is in the end, you know, improved by the solution that you are building. So I would usually request an interview, you know, and, and ask them to include relevant stakeholders. At the beginning of the meeting, I, I'll position and I, I'll give an overview of what we will be discussing. And if there are people that they need to call into the meeting, we either reschedule or call them in. If there are people that can be excused that happens too. And then we start talking about, I think one of my favorite questions that brings about a lot of information is what are you seeing in the business that is not supposed to be happening? Why do you think that is? You know, let's look at incidents or near misses, um, those kind of things that, that you are seeing creeping up, customer complaints, just ordinary things. Because what we are good at is to see things that other people inside the business take for granted. That is why we're the learning experts. And it is sometimes those things that they take for granted, they almost overlook it that become one of the root causes of the problem. So in having those conversations and really, you know, untethering these, these things and, and where they come from, where they originate from, who is involved, what technology is involved, which processes are not working well. You know, sometimes we end up saying, you need a new system. Um, yes, we can build something for you. We can build a, a training solution, but I don't believe in selling something that's not going to make a difference. So then I would rather say, recommend a new software product or a new system or redesign the process. Mm -hmm. um, but having those conversations, Jason, have been the most valuable and the rich, richest information um, that you can gather, as opposed to just reading a document that somebody has put together and, you know, faltered um, and curated. Yeah. So as someone who, who goes to a lot of different businesses and, and, and kind of, of unpacks and tries to understand what's going on in those organizations, are you seeing kind of a pattern of common themes emerging in modern businesses today that, you know, they're kind of generally tending to struggle with the same types of things, or is it quite different? I think there are common, common denominators, and I can, I think I can link it back to the generations even in the workplace. So, um, you know, something that pops up all the time is communication, plain old communication skills and, you know, how to communicate clearly um, and well to build positive relationships and out outcomes. And I even find that, you know, those are learning points for myself as well. When I write a brief to my team, have I really communicated this clearly? If they only had this, would they know exactly what to do? 
the other thing that I think um, are common uh, is a common thread um, is risk, managing risk, specifically people's awareness of cybersecurity and the risk that the human factor plays um, in organizations' cybersecurity. Um, and then there was something else, and it is eluding me now, but it was quite important. Maybe we can circle back. <laughs> Absolutely. So I, I think the other thing I was quite curious about, besides the, the, the kind of, of themes, was you know, when, you were, when you were talking about <clears throat> how you approach an organization, and I thought, well, it, it's ideal, right? Because you're coming in with a fresh perspective. You're kind of a, you're applying a bit of a beginner mindset. But I thought, how would you, how would you be able to do that if, if you were an in-house L&D professional who had been working in that environment for five years or 10 years? You know, there'd be a risk that you kind of got trapped into this, that I really know everything kind of, of, of trap. And wondering, like, is there any advice you can give for someone to kind of almost do a, like, how do you get back into, into that kind of inquisitive mindset approach if, if you've you know, been in the same organization for such a long time? That's such a good point, Jason, because we, what we find when working with subject matter experts is the amount of things that they take for granted. And you know, mm -hmm. um, you know, when you work um, in the software environment, there's a lot of things that you take for granted just because it's, it's become part of your DNA, it's second nature. And I think for an L&D professional that's deeply embedded in the business or that has been there for a number of years, where I, I want to say the checks and balances that I would build into my design process would be going back to your target audience and, and as you design, as you write with this learner in front of you, that's what my mentor used to say, talk to this learner, imagine them in front of you, um, is to think about any word, any term, any concept that could create a barrier to learning. If you think about a mathematical um, formula, if, if I'm explaining step one and step two and step three, and I'm with you, but I get stuck on step three, and you continue to step four and five and six, my mind has created a barrier to learning because I don't understand how to get from step two to three. So in anything you write, you should ask yourself, am I making an assumption that this person will know what this thing is? Can I move on with you know, my writing or my activity without explaining this first? And that is how you know, we design is with anything. And, and that's part of our technical QA process as well to say, have we made an assumption here that this is embedded knowledge that this person has, you know, is familiar with this, knows what it means and can move on? Or is this a place where they are going to get mentally or cognitively stuck? Mm. Yeah, I think that's really interesting insight. Um, so I'm going to come go in a completely different direction now. I'm, I'm very curious to get your thoughts on um, what you know. What are you going to be excited about in the next two or three years? Like, what is the stuff that's happening in the learning and development industry that that kind of of like gets your kind of heart racing? I think definitely virtual and augmented reality. Um, I think companies are starting to realize the value in terms of, you know, identifying your high risk areas in the business. You know, somewhere where if a mistake is made, you either stand to lose a lot of money or damage your reputation, or even, um, you know, it might cost the life of a staff member or a client. Those kind of areas, um, to use virtual reality and even augmented reality in, in just um, process training 
um, to, to use that to augment what we already have in place. I think it's a, a, a much safer and cheaper way of training people in terms of the real, real life risks that they face um, doing physical training. I think the other thing that I'm extremely um, positive about is that customers or clients are starting to realize the value of games, serious games, but also gamified learning in terms of engaging and motivating staff um, to learn, to perform better during learning, but also, you know, the benefits that we've seen in, you know, from gamification back in the workplace. And in, I think, specifically South Africa, um, I suppose that we can view it as challenges, but I view it as opportunities. I, I'm very excited about the L&D space and what we can do to upskill our workforce. There are millions of people that need to be taught to be capable to be employable, and this is the best time. Um, I think, I'm not sure if it was Eisenhower that says never waste a good crisis and I think it's time, you know, for the L&D space or professionals and our community to come together and to, to put our heads together and solve this problem specifically in South Africa. And I mean, what does that look like though? I mean, are you talking about solving the the technical mechanics of how to kind of get more people trained, or are you talking about what specific skills people need to be, you know, kind of of adaptive and successful in the future? What, what does it look like for you? I think it is both. I think that there's a big element of, of, of soft skills that are required to get people work ready, mm -hmm. um, mentally, psychologically, you know, to build that grit, um, to understand what to expect from a workplace, what your employer expects of you, um, and how to cope in an environment where technology is moving at a lightning speed. I mean, sometimes it makes me anxious too, but then I start researching, right? Um, so that's on, on the soft skills side. But I think on the technical side as well, we've got a lot of opportunities to train people technically, but it is also about how we package that, how we deliver that, and how we support these people throughout the learning, the learning journeys to make sure that when they exit, they really have a skill set that makes them employable. If I have an interview with you, I can tell that you have learned something. There's retention. You are able to apply these things. That it's not just lip service, that we don't just push content. Um, so for me, that is what it looks like. Again, I'm coming back to how we design. Mm. Yeah, I was, I was, you mentioned a word there, which I'd actually really like to explore a little bit is, is grit. I mean, I hear grit and resilience a lot in, um, in leadership uh, conversations, in culture conversations. And um, you brought it up in the context of, of kind of, of, you know, teaching new generations. And it's, it's, it's a word that's being used more and more kind of, um, you know, recently, I think you know, 10 years ago, nobody would have probably mentioned grit or resilience as things that they needed to teach anybody. And my question, I guess, is why? You know, I, I think I know the answer, but I'm very curious to hear your, your kind of take on why grit and resilience are, are such critical skills to learn. Is, is it just, you know, businesses are, are expecting more, they have higher demands and, and people's stress levels are going through the roof, or, or what is it? I think it's a combination of things. If I, if I bring it back to, to our team, you know, grit is an incredibly important characteristic of our job because what we do and how we envision a solution to work, and when you start building it practically, you run into problems. 
and you test and iterate and test and iterate and and that process that agile design process alone requires a lot of grit we talk about keep on keeping on and doing it with a positive attitude i think that is is very important but in terms of the culmination of factors if you think about the pressure that businesses are under in terms of a strained economy and you know being profitable so there there are there's a lot of um, pressure if you think about it can uh, the economy and how people are suffering financially there's a lot of pressure um in south africa you know you will find that two out of three um unemployed people are youths and they are expected to take care of an extended family so it's not just about my career aspirations and how i want to grow it's about that pressure of you know putting bread on the table so having grit and and you know doing that difficult the difficult things over and over sometimes with a positive attitude for me that is what makes the difference that is what brings a team together that is what makes a difficult project end up being a success because in the end <clears throat> that positivity is actually what enables you to see the solution if you if you become negative if you give up um in your mind even though you're sitting there and you're trying i think that shuts down your cognitive process and and your open mindedness to okay but what else could i try so grit to me is is to be able to cope with a lot of factors that are thrown at people these days they have very little control over it but we do have a choice in terms of you know how we perceive it and how we're going to tackle it and i would like to see that people have you know that inside resilience or, or internal resilience to be able to say even though things are bad or challenging or even though this job is hard i'm going to do it with a positive attitude and i'm going to give my best i think that is what what it is for me yeah. um so on the subject of grit i i guess you know what i'm quite curious to hear is you know from from your in, your perspective is is we talked about what you know what the things are that excite you but you know i'm also curious to know what are the things that you're kind of worrying a little bit about what are the things that you're thinking the l&d industry is going to have to overcome that are going to be you know kind of of obstacles that are thrown in its path um that are going to kind of present big challenges for the industry um for me personally i think ai is going to be have a big impact i think it's going to impact us positively but i am i do have concerns um i i know what deep research and experience it takes to really step into the psyche of a learner to anticipate their thought processes their attitudes their behaviors and i suppose that my concern is if we are going to use ai to build learning programs how will ai be able to build in that empathy that a human designer has for their learner i think that is one of my biggest concerns at this stage you were referring to the human to human connection and i think to to design with empathy is something it's a critical success factor um in 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 a learning program um i think the other key obstacle that we might need to overcome is to understand that technology is a vehicle it is an enabler but it is it's not the content it's not the learning you layer technology over your design and 
sometimes what I find is that a client almost decides on a technology platform or solution before they've even thought about the design. Um, you know, what is really going to solve the problem? So that is something, that is a, a challenge that Alan D will have to address to say, yes, let's use technology. It can definitely, it can probably make things cheaper, it can scale, it can create the consistency that we want in the message, but it should be the vehicle only. It's, it's not the core solution, not always, not in learning. Mm. Well, I, I, would, I would say not ever in any, in any form, forget learning. I think, um, yeah, I, I think as, yeah, I mean, as humans, we tend to get, I think, um, over enamored by technology, but it's, it really is just an enabler, as you say, not, not the actual solution to the problem. Um, right, so I, I guess, you know, the final two questions I have for you, um, the first one is, is we always ask for our guests to share a little bit of wisdom um, and, and, and having, having almost, you know, kind of been in a position where you're a brand new learning and development kind of professional in a whole bunch of new organizations, you get to do it again and again and again. You know, my, my advice or the advice I'd, I'd be curious to hear from you is someone who is stepping into a new environment, um, who's, you know, who's got to kind of navigate all of this complexity we've talked about, you know, kind of try and be effective in that environment, do that like kind of root cause analysis, find, you know, find the data, find the problems, find the thing that's going to matter. What, what would your biggest piece of advice to them be? I would, I would suggest that you build strong connections across your organization. So again, I want to go back to that systems thinking approach so that you understand the organization as an organism that um, is influenced by internal and external factors across the entire value chain and through the support services. So that would be, I think, my one piece of advice. The other piece of advice is that you have got to keep on reading, listening to podcasts. You have to know what is happening in the talent management industry under which Alan D is, you know, of which Alan D is a, a part of. But you have to see it as your role, uh, as part of a bigger strategy, as part of a bigger plan. And when you understand those trends and challenges, I think we are in a better position to create solutions that are going to be effective and that are going to make a difference yeah that's great um yeah i mean i i, I think you know a lot of uh, a lot of the challenges i think you've described quite well is um you know is is building those relationships and, and understanding you know almost not only building the relationships but understanding the relationships between those people in the organization and how they have an impact on on each other um, last question we always ask is, you know, um, if you've read a book, listened to a podcast, saw something, experienced something that's had a profound effect on you recently. I think the book that I would like to mention is, uh, it's called Tools of Titans by Tim Ferriss. And it's a compilation of short interviews with really titans of medicine and industry and sport and comedy and um, it's really a delightful book I've learned facts and weird things and and just gotten perspectives that I have never considered and that has brought a lot of smiles laughter and wisdom to my life that's brilliant well on that note we've come to the end um, so Carla I think it's been a fascinating conversation. Um, it's always great. We, we often, you know, speak to people in many different aspects. And I think, you know, it's as being a consultant who's got to kind of like almost, you know, do the same thing over and over again, but differently every single time and constantly being in a role where you've got to kind of, of learn and adapt. Yeah, it, it's, 
it's fascinating to kind of I'll get your experience on that and how it's how how you navigate that in the learning and development space. So thank you very much for joining us. It's been a great conversation. Thank you, Jason. All right, we're done. Hey, thanks so much for joining us for this episode of Impact Learning Visionaries. If you found it interesting or helpful, please subscribe by clicking on the button down below so you don't miss our next one. Also, be sure to check out our Reality Bytes blog for more information on how technology is aiding in learning development. Links are all in the description below. Go check it out. Thanks a lot. Bye.